Good evening and welcome to In the Studio. I'm Dr. Mark Schenker, Associate Vice Provost for Outreach and Engagement at the University of California, Davis, and Director of the Center of Expertise on Migration and Health of the University of California Global Health Institute. Our topic tonight is indigenous population and effect on health among migrants. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have Sandra Nichols with me. Sandra is a research geographer at the University of California at Berkeley and has a lot of experience in this area. So welcome, Sandra, uh, to the program, and thank you for coming. Good to be here, Mark. Thanks. So perhaps let's just start with your background and how you got interested in this topic of looking at health among in the indigenous. Well, before I got to the indigenous, and we can in a minute say really what we mean by indigenous, but um, I got really interested in Mexican migrants to California, and that came out of that period in the early 90s when there was just that really horrible, really toxic attitude towards uh, Mexican migrants, uh, you know, one of these real backlash times. And uh, I, my sense was if, if people knew <laughs> who they were and had a more of a sense of them as human beings, as neighbors, where they came from, what their lives were like, maybe they would kind of tamp down on some of this real hostility and uh, negative reaction. So I went in and I started studying Mexican migration, but in particular an approach of what we call transnational communities. P the hometown where people come from, what conditions were like there, why they decided or had to leave where the whole journey to the states and then where they come, the destination community and what life is like there, the conditions. And so then you start to build up this fascinating story and history of these communities from specific places in Mexico and then clusters here. And that whole work, which I wrote about, I was working in primarily in uh, northern Mexican communities, uh, Spanish speaking, because I'm fluent in Spanish, so that was another reason to, to work in this field. Um, uh, but that work with uh, Mexican migrants and then farm workers um, led me to a fantastic collaboration with uh, Rick Mines, a long-standing uh, farm labor uh, researcher and other colleagues, to uh, look at issues related to people coming from indigenous communities in Mexico, the indigenous farm workers. And we can get into what that, who we mean by that. Like well, that. why don't we do that? So, okay. who are the indigenous and uh, okay. how are they similar or different from other uh, Mexicans that we have some idea about? Um, yes, the uh, first off, as we always say uh, as researchers, it's not for us to define the indigenous. Um, they uh, define themselves as such, but for the purposes of our research, the indigenous farm worker study, uh, we chose, uh, worked with people um, who come from communities, hometowns, where an indigenous language is spoken. And so what we mean by this are these languages that predate the conquest. These are, you know, some of them are, go back at least two, three thousand years. These are really ancient, deep languages um, that are not at all in the um, Indo-European tradition. Um, and some of these have survived the last 400, 400, 500 years of brutality and, and um, discrimination. And those people who, f these indigenous communities primarily in Mexico are in southern parts of Mexico, the southern states, Oaxaca, in eastern Guerrero, Puebla, Chiapas, and so forth. And folks from these remote villages are the ones who have now started to come to California as farm workers coming in at the very bottom rung of the labor ladder and the very low wage jobs. And it's a pretty new phenomenon. And so very little was known about this and we were asked to try to get a better understanding to provide this to a wider audience and to, to the healthcare community. So I assume there are unique factors in this population. You mentioned language and Spanish not yeah. being the native language and are there other uh, factors, uh, influences on health I among indigenous that one needs to be aware of when, when thinking about the health of this population? Yes, and before you even get to health, it's like what are their lives, what kind of um, 
what circumstances are they coming from, what are they encountering here. And um, as I mentioned, these are people who are coming from pretty often pretty remote areas where the Mexican government has not um, provided much in the way of services. Often there are no, uh, very little in the way of education or what exists only goes up to uh, two or three years, four years. Uh, oftentimes women have very little education, don't even speak Spanish themselves. Um, there are people who've already migrated elsewhere within Mexico to work in agriculture on a contract basis, on a temporary migration uh, basis. Um, very poor, um, very, very hard workers. Uh, but then um, what happens when they cross the border is that all of the discrimination that they experienced in Mexico, because they are really viewed oftentimes regrettably as second, third class citizens, that gets perpetuated here on this side of the border so that they um, really experience discrimination, poor treatment by the mestizo, Spanish-speaking um, um, crew bosses, mayordomos, con uh, labor contractors, and also by the landlords who are renting them, their, their apartments or the houses. And when they bump into the healthcare system, again, um, if their, their Spanish is, uh, you know, as a second language, the interpreters there in the health cl uh, clinics who may speak Spanish don't necessarily recognize that they're from an indigenous community and speak an indigenous language. And so they just think they're dumb or they, they can't express themselves. So they, there are multiple levels in which they're isolated linguistically, you know, culturally, through poverty, and, um, and yet, their languages are these extraordinarily beautiful uh, ancient languages that are really in risk of being, um, of being lost. So I imagine you've had a lot of experiences, encounters with people who have uh, received this type of treatment and it's affected them in their lives or their health or mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. family. Uh, can you think of something that might illustrate uh, sure, what you're sure. talking about? Um, one, uh, in, in the healthcare setting, I remember a, a woman um, who works as an interpreter, actually, uh, who speaks Spanish, not too much English, but some uh, like Mixteco. The languages we're speaking about here are Mixteco primarily, um, uh, Zapoteco, Triqui. These are the main language groups we find amongst the, the indigenous farm workers in California. But there are actually 23 different languages. So in a healthcare setting, even if you have someone who speaks one of these languages, this person might come with a different language. And there's a real resistance to following, say, say a physician uh, prescribes something, and they look at this and they're not even sure what is being prescribed to them, what it's for, because they say, you can't understand me. How do I know this is gonna serve me anything, uh, be of any, uh, any use? And so there's a real um, concern about um, lack of compliance. You know, people don't follow, the doctor does his or her best, but there's not necessarily, uh, it's going to be followed because there was really a lack of communication, uh, even if, even with an interpreter there. So there's a real um, anxiety, really, uh, about approaching the Western medical setting. And so how does that sort itself out if you have the indigenous farm worker who has a medical problem is hesitant even if they have access to medical care mm -hmm. do they go to alternative uh, uh, that, avenues that that's a really interesting question and one of the things we found in this study is that um, men in particular and they are the you know the larger percentage of the indigenous farm workers as they are farm workers in general they avoid it like the plague. They stay away from the, uh, even if they have insurance, and very few do, <coughs> even if they can afford it, which, you know, cost is another issue, um, they, they really avoid the modern medical um, services. And so the first step is um, self-medicate or um, look for an herbalist or um, a, various other traditional resources that do exist within the community. They could be these um, sobadores, massage specialists, or uh, curanderos and traditional healers. And if that's not working, um, 
Well, go down to a local um, uh, herbalist shop and ask the, um, the salesperson for advice. So, or go to a pharmacy and buy something somebody recommended or mentioned, or go to a Mexican grocery store or a flea market. And here is the person uh, who's a salesperson actually acting as a pharmacist for this, uh, this person with a, a problem, an ailment that isn't yet to be diagnosed. Um, many of the people that we interviewed will actually go all the way to Mexico, cross the border to seek treatment. Uh, even though this involves a lot of expense, time off of work, and um, a risk getting back if they're undocumented. And then only as a really a last, last resort, go to the emergency room. And then it's, you know, pretty... <laughs> so as a physician, I can say that for some health problems, delay in getting diagnosis and treatment is going to make the outcomes worse. Mm -hmm. For those problems that would get better by themselves and are self-limited, it might not make a difference. But in the other situation, uh, this could be a real problem. Yeah. And with women, it's a really uh, very, very serious and troubling uh, situation in particular. Uh, women do uh, access uh, the clinics uh, at a higher rate, uh, but much less than mestiza women. Mestiza women farm workers are, and of course, much at a much lower rate than the uh, broader population or, um, you know, in, in California in general, women in general. And the real serious problem here, though, is with um, not accessing uh, prenatal care. Uh, and so they, uh, part of it is because they're not used to that. There's no prenatal care often in these remote villages. Uh, they're used to just, you know, going to the midwife. And if there's no complications, okay, that works out fine. But there's a really high rate of women dying in childbirth in these indigenous communities in Mexico. Um, it, the United Na Nations estimates it's among the really high rates of, of women mortality. Hard to get data, but we know it's a lot higher than uh, for the um, mestiza women, overall women uh, in, in Mexico. So they're already uh, have problems accessing, uh, getting prenatal care. And the same thing applies once they come to this side, to, to the U.S. And then they wind up, when they come, they go to the clinic when it's time to deliver. So immediately they're put as high-risk pregnancy. And um, it, they become terrified because they're surrounded by bright lights, by machines, by tubes, by men touching them. This is really quite frightening, that men touching their bodies, they don't know what's going on. So it's a really traumatic uh, experience to give birth in this country, and uh, very much in contrast to the, a traditional way, which involves surrounding a very joyful moment, surrounded by friends, by other women, by um, a sense of uh, um, care, um, herb, drinking herbal teas, oh, giving ice chips to a woman uh, in labor. This is completely against any of the, their particular beliefs. And then they're used to having sweat baths afterwards and a, a time of uh, recovery, which they become very frightened in the context here. So you raised some many topics, but I, I want to focus on the public health issues yeah. and the indigenous, because right off it occurs to me that even if we have programs for public health education mm -hmm. that are in English and Spanish, you may not be reaching this population. But of course, public health involves a lot more in terms of educating the, the population. And is that something where you've seen particular uh, deficiency in, in the indigenous communities? Um, certainly, there's a whole difference in understanding um, the body and understanding what is health, what is disease. So there's kind of this, this gulf and understanding. Um, in our work, we, we were very interested in also talking to providers and what is their level of understanding and appreciation for of the indigenous and this sense that they are um, operating in a different worldview, a different context. And so um, 
yes, there, at one level there's a need for um, outreach and understanding um, and ex explaining kind of the introduction to the Western medical system, but there also is a need for a lot of training of American or Western providers to start to build this, bridge this gap, I think, that, that exists. It's kind of two worlds that have to start to meet each other in, in terms of, of respect. Well, let me raise two specific areas of public health and prevention that yeah. we know work, that are effective, but that really require the individual or the community to accept and to uh, buy into. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one would be pap smears and prevention of cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. This is a major reason that we have greatly reduced the health burden from cervical cancer. Is that something that would be a particular challenge in the indigenous community? And I'll give you the other one, and you can cover whichever, which would be vaccinations, mm -hmm. uh, both the standard battery of vaccination as well as the flu vaccine and others for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. potential epidemic uh, outbreaks. So those are two demonstratedly effective public health interventions. Right, right. And I'm wondering from your experience, have you seen these in uh, the indigenous community? Are there particular challenges or how... how could we do better? Um, those are both really good areas uh, in this respect uh, to, to try to talk about, get at. Um, the cervical, uh, the pap smears and um, cervical exams, oh, well, <laughs> that's a, a real challenge. And uh, just to tell a little story, a, a woman who works in a clinic uh, along the coast in Ventura County was uh, telling me, and here she, she is, Mixteca originally, um, so she speaks Mixteco, um, English, and Spanish, and she's been hired by a clinic to serve as a translator and try to put <coughs> women at ease. And she has an enormous um, difficulty and challenge in trying to put a woman at ease for a cervical exam. For one thing, they've never had anything like this, to um, anything to do with the reproductive uh, systems of the body is, is sort of taboo, you don't discuss it. And the other is, she doesn't have terminology. There aren't, there isn't the vocabulary to uh, describe cervix, to de describe um, other conditions, whether it's diabetes, asthma, and so forth. So there's a language issue. Uh, words, language to describe a women's, the parts of the women's reproductive system. So there's huge kinds of barriers there. Uh, but it's not insurmountable with the right kind of training um, and um, context in the clinic of, of treating. It takes more time, but with, with gentleness and with respect and, and explaining to them, you know, you do start to have women willing to come in and willing to get these kinds of tests. Um, and quickly, let me jump over to the um, immunization. There's some uh, with some really important work being done with these outreach workers, the Promotora programs, and also uh, with some of the radio stations, Radio Bilingue has programs in Mixteco and in Zapoteco and Triqui, and they start talking about that and bring physicians on to the radio, and people are interested. Uh, so, so there's ways to do it, but it requires, uh, you know, an appreciation and understanding and real um, respect, I think, in approaching. The promotoras have been mentioned before. I think that's mm -hmm. important. Can you just describe what promotoras are and perhaps how they add uh -huh. to the health system, particularly for uh, this population, to, to the public health effort? Yes, it's um, a, a really wonderful kind of approach. It's really um, the outreach nurse. It's the kind of a trained person, doesn't have to have a whole nursing degree, but a trained person who's trusted in the community, who can approach uh, members of the community, explain to them, encourage them to come to the clinic. They're really a bridge, a lay bridge between the, um, uh, the Western medical system and, uh, you know, this rural population. Very well developed systems in Mexico and uh, you know, I'm sure you can tell us more about them, too. <laughs> well, and I, I would just highlight that public health is not the same as health care, and that 
increasingly our understanding is that so many of the factors that affect our health are because of our environments, our behavior, mm -hmm. our diet, our activities, um, those non-medical things. And of course, these are all appropriate for promotoras or others to uh, educate a community. Right, right. Uh, and then having, um, interviewing those promotoras, how health outreach workers on these radio programs um, that are listened to <coughs> by uh, members of the indigenous community, um, the Mistec Hour or the Sapotec Hour. Um, but even more, there, there's, uh, they've been developing some really fascinating, creative approaches to try to reach out to um, this community and to the women. And um, it involves uh, promotoras, it, it also involves um, having in the clinic, one really good example I think is this little clinic in, um, in Oxnard. They have hired uh, interpreters and then they, the women who are coming through the prenatal program, they arrange trips to the hospital and they visit the delivery room. So they actually see, they get a little sense of what's coming up and it, it helps, you know, relax them and ease them and make them more willing to uh, be um, uh, accept the kinds of wonderful services. Because let me just say that I mentioned the very high rate of uh, women dying in childbirth in Mexico. Well, here it's about a tenth of that for the indigenous women. Uh, so, you know, there's obvious enormous benefits to being able to, you know, access our health care system. I'm still fascinated by your comment that the terminology for many of the parts of the body or Mm -hmm. or, or other health-related outcomes doesn't even exist. What a challenge that is to overcome, uh, to educate someone when you have to uh, develop the terminology. Exactly, exactly. And then it's, but it's almost these intermediaries. I think they're being, doing extraordinary work in themselves, challenging themselves to try to figure out how to bridge this gap and to communicate and do it in a really gentle and way that the patient will come back. So I, I sense by your tone that you have a bit of optimism that things are better, that there's still a ways to go, but that it may be you know, going in the right direction. Is that accurate to say, or, oh. <laughs> uh, or is this uh, into the uh, dangerous area of predicting the future? <laughs> well, that and also, unfortunately, the trends, I, I mentioned that the indigenous are becoming more and more um, present in the farm worker population in the last 20 years, they've increased by four times. So um, they, um, this is something that I think the, the healthcare system, the public health system has not yet come to grips with, but there are really interesting uh, small scale models I think that could be um, scaled up. And um, I think that's the challenge is for both sides to really scale up and the there are indigenous organizations. We, we list them, uh, there's a website that's um, uh, where we post a lot of the research and the findings and there's some links to really creative approaches to dealing with this. Well, we're running out of time. Perhaps can you tell us what that website is and uh, for people interested, they could go there and learn more about this topic. Sure, it's uh, www.indigenousfarmworkers um, onestream.org. Uh -huh. And so, or you can just Google uh, indigenous farm workers and it will pop up. And uh, within the state agencies and county agencies, your sense is that there are some areas that are coming up with these innovative programs and, and new approaches to address this issue. Well, some of the most creative work we've seen is on um, the Central Coast. The, the um, indigenous farm workers are concentrated. Almost half of them are on the central coast from, say, Oxnard up to uh, Watsonville area. And in Oxnard in particular, there's some uh, very exciting work being done organizing within the community. Uh, less so in the Central Valley. They have a little further to go. I wonder, as we wrap up, if this isn't just the story that we see repeated over and over with immigrants, that we have new populations, new uh, places of origin, uh, but, but that the story repeats itself and that the challenges in a, a larger sense are really the same. It's people with different backgrounds, different experience, different culture, uh, 
and how do you adjust that and bring them into uh, the country and address their health needs. I'm glad you brought that up because especially in California agriculture we have this constant replacement of workers at the bottom, uh, the, the low wage, and now it, it, you know, it was the Chinese, it was the Japanese, it was Portuguese and Mexicans, now the new group coming in are the indigenous. Well, I think we're about out of time. I want to thank you for a fascinating insight into a group that's not recognized or thought about, but which is providing a, a major uh, s resource and service to the state for sure, and in which there are real unique health needs that we need to address. So thank you, Sandra Nichols, uh, for your contribution uh, and for coming here tonight. Well, thanks for having me. Well, that wraps up this uh, show of uh, In the Studio. Uh, my name is Mark Schenker, and it's been my pleasure to explore another area of uh, migration and health uh, and some of the innovative and interesting programs happening in California to address this topic. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>